welcome everybody to the session. Um, and we're going to have presentations from University of KwaZulu Natal. And we look like we have an interesting lineup of presentations. And so the format is that you will present for 25 minutes and then we would have five minutes uh, for questioning. So I will give you a shout out at five minutes when five minutes is left. And then um, can I ask if people have any questions as we go along as well to include them in the chat and then we can pick up the questions by the end of the presentation. That would really be useful and, and help us in our discussions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speakers this morning. Um, Loiso, Dr. Loiso Matriko and Mluma, Mlamuli Hatswayo from University of KwaZulu-Natal. And they will be speaking about the access and success of black students at university, an ideological argument from the global south. Thank you, Loiso and Mlamuli, welcome. Um, good morning, colleagues. Um, thank you for that introduction, Delicia. I'll be sharing my screen quickly on what I'll be presenting with um, Dr. Mulamoli Satwayo. So basically, colleagues, this is the paper that we are writing with my Leonard colleague. Uh, that is basically looking at the access and success of black students at university, we're taking that ideological argument from the global south. And in this presentation, we will give you the national statistics, which basically indicates the access and the success or the performance, if you like, of the black students nationally. And we draw it down to the institutional context, um, picking one institution of interest, i.e. that will be UKZN, and we take it further and zoom into the performance of one particular discipline of interest, which is the become accounting students. We look at the racial performance of these students. And later on, um, Dr. Satchua is gonna come in to look at the ideological perspective and argue with the importance of access and success of black students. Look at also the experiences of our students across institutions in South Africa. And also our intervention in this regard, the proposal that we're making, um, which we believe that will make a difference. Now, you, you'll remember that it's, a, it's been about at least five years since the emergency of the fall list movement, i.e. your fees must fall, roads must fall, um, Asinama list student protest in South African higher education. And I mean, there were also calls for decolonization, transformation, and reforms of the higher education. So this was basically a fight against the exclusionary and the alienating nature of higher education system in South Africa. And from this, in addition, actually, um, on what shaped, or basically on what shaped and informed this process was the assumption that the public university in South Africa is a colonial invention, i.e., it does not serve the needs of the majority of black students. So there was that rise and rise of the neoliberal university in South Africa. So we are looking at, that's our context basically, we are looking at the access to the university, i.e. your formal access and the epistemic access. We are concerned about mental issues, well-being of our students with the pressure that comes be, with just being in this space. And also we are looking at the digital divide, the inequalities of our students in the institutions of high learning. Now, this is a data, um, this is a national data that shows the headcount enrollment by race. And you'll observe that from 2014, it has been rising up to 2019, which is our key focus for this paper. From 2014 to 2019, we have observed that it has been increasing. Um, I mean, the access, the enrollment of African students. And this is something that we are celebrating. As much as we are celebrating it from 70% in 2014 to 77% in 2019, which is a remarkable increase, it's a very significant increase. We have also observed that 
even institutionally, this, the trends are similar. Whether you look at UK, then you'll see that uh, there are more, there is more enrollment of African students. We are saying we celebrate this, and after celebrating, we are celebrating it. We are interested on the experiences of the Black students now that they do have access in terms of just enrollment, in terms of just being there. What is the experience of the Black students? How is the performance of the Black, of, of, of the black students? And what are the challenges that Black students are faced with in academia? We took one group of students, that is your undergrad students that finished in 2020, and we looked at the final mark of, the, of, of, of these students to look at where they are in terms of their performance. How did they perform? And this is um, in the UK ZN context. So we observed that about 7% of African students range from 0 to 49% at the end of, um, of, 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 of their four-year period in the university. And most of these students, you realize that they have failed, others have been excluded, but you are concerned about that 7% because we are saying this is a group of students that is supposed by virtue of being at UKZ, and we are supposed to have already identified them that there is a high risk of failure, perhaps depending on the metric points that they had even before they entered the institution. Therefore, that needs the needed already to be support systems that are in place that um, seek to address whatever challenges that they might be faced in their performance. And then we are looking at, at, at the other group between 50 to 59 points. And we're observing that about 22% of African students are found in this category at the end of their graduate, of their graduation period, sorry, of their undergrad studies. And then we are observing quite a significant number of um, students across racial groups that are seated between six to 69 points. And we are submitting that this is a group that is often left behind. No one talks about it because we think that when they're in this range of 60 to 69, therefore they have achieved. Whereas institutions should then develop support systems that deal directly with the students that have a potential of being cum laude students. And we believe that these students do have a potential of being cum laude students. It's just that perhaps at that time, there were no systems that are in place to support them so that they can spread their wings um, and get to the point of reaching that um, cum laude mark. So of, out of concern, again, about 30% of African students are found in this position. But if you look at the other end, the cream of the crop of the institution, you'll realize the cream of the crop, i.e. 79, 75 to 100% your cum laude students, you realize that it's mostly whites and Indian students who are there, about 47% of white students are ranging between 75 and 100%, and 46% of um, Indian students are in the same range. When you look at our African students, they are seated at, 20, uh, uh, at 23%. The question is, wh wh what is happening? What is their experience? Why do we have more students who are black who are coming into the system, but we've got less of them in terms of their performance? Is it an issue of, quality versus quantity, food for thought. Okay, my slides just moved very quickly. All right, so we then took one group of students, that is your accounting students, become accounting students with the potential of being chartered accountants in South Africa. Now, there's an initial test of competency that they write, irrespective of which institution you are enrolled in. You, you, you write the same paper, you write the same paper. So this is a paper that they all wrote. And we are observing a trend from 2014 to 2019. This is the national statistics of students that wrote the initial test of competency. So we observe that from 2014, we can say that the black students were, were, were doing pretty well with 71% student pass rate as compared to the 80% pass rate of white students. So you'll see that there was about a nine points difference between the academic performance, which is reasonably okay. 
and you move to 20, 2015, it started to decline. 2016, the black students up to 2019 dropped in terms of their pass rate, reaching 56% in 2019. Strangely, if you look at the white students on the other hand, as the black students are dropping in terms of their pass rate and performance, you'll realize that the white students were doing quite very well, significantly well. It has been increasing their performance from that 80% in January 2014 to 88% in 2019. Let's just look at 2019, ladies and gentlemen, in January. You will see that there's a 32% difference between the white students and the black students nationally in terms of their performance. The question will be, what is happening? What is the experience of the black students in South Africa? In this instance, become accounting students. In general, black South Africans in South Africa who are enrolled in institutions of high learning. We can then get some more interest on what might be happening institutionally, because this data set was just giving you um, the, the national data. Let's look at what is happening institutionally. We took this data, which, then, which is dis disaggregated by race and institution. And we just took about five institutions of interest. Um, you are looking at VETS on the left side. We can see that about 150 students from Vets University set for this exam, i.e. the ITC exam. 150 students who are Africans set for this exam, and it's about 80% of them that pass. Well, we agree that they did remar remarkably well. And you compare them with whites, about 41% of white students, sorry, 41 students set for this exam who are white, and 3% of white students passed, while 91% passed um, who are Indian. That is OK. These students are doing very well at VET. And then we look at um, University of Pretoria. Out of 40 students that set for this exam, 85% of them who are Africans passed. You see, you can, we can agree that um, they are doing very well at the University of Pretoria. And you look at the white students and how they are performing, 147 students set for the very same exam and 95% of them pass. Wow, there's a lot that we can learn from this institution in terms of the support systems that they have in place and, and, and how we are keeping up and ensuring that there's student success across all the racial groups. We can agree in principle on that. But when you get to UKZN, you realize that out of 33 students that set of African students that set for the same exam, it is only 67% of the African students that passed. But if you look at the Indian students, you've got about 99 students that set for the very same exam and approximately 81% of the Indian students at UKZN pass this exam. The question is, why are so much racial differences in the pass rate? Food for thought. And if you look at, uh, an institution such as um, University of Forte, we know that this institution is dominated by black students. Um, we can see that out of 53 students that were sitting for the exam, it's only 53% that passed. Should we be concerned? We are concerned. We are concerned about the performance of black students across institutions. If you are looking at this diagram, you will see whether you are at Vets University, whether you are at Forte University, the African students are at the other hand, are, 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 they, 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 they are at, 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 at the lower end in terms of their performance. We don't see them as leading. We don't see them as doing extremely well. Well, we do see the success that, and we are acknowledging it from Vets and University of Pretoria. But when you look at UKZN, when you look at the University of Forte, it's an area of concern for our black students that are in these institutions. The question will be, what is it that these institutions are doing that we are not able to do? And that is something that we are investigating. In the last part um, that I'll be speaking on, bear with me, my slides are taking forever to move. 
All right. In the last part that I'll, I'll be speaking on, it's just an area of interest in terms of the entrance requirement across the institutions that I've just mentioned for you above. And, and, and it's an interest specifically for the BCom accounting students that I'll be focusing on. Now, we are saying here, if all these students are starting from the same entry point, i.e. the national senior certificate that they all have when they enroll into the institution of higher learning, well, we know that they are expected to get ready for the same board of exam in about four years. Now, the question is, how do they end up with the different points of entry? Because when you go to the Vets University, Vets University will say, um, I mean, it's 42% is necessary for you to, to become accounting. But when you go to Waters Solu, Waters Solu is saying 28% is okay. Forte University is saying 26% is okay for you um, to do become accounting. UK is saying 32% is sufficient for you to do become accounting. But if you want to do the extended program, then 30% is okay. Now, the question is, what makes one institution decide what is appropriate entrance requirement? in the same discipline. In addition to that, these are the same students that will be writing the same exam at the end um, of a certain period. Perhaps school this not mean that the outcomes, the results that we have observed in the previous slide are as the result of the entrance requirements across these institutions. Food for thought. Okay, we, 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 we have students at the lower end of the scale. We agree on that. We understand the students that are enrolling at UK that most of them are from quantile one to quantile three. Most of them are black students. Same applies with UFH. The question is, what systems do we have in place? Do we have enough built, have you built enough systems to support these kind of students that we have? So these are areas of, of, area, area of concerns for us that we believe they need to be given much attention for the success of all students across um, the, the races. At this, state, at this instance, we are concerned about the academic progress of black students. Over to you, uh, Dr. Mulamuli. Thank you so much, Dr. Matrigo. Um, in the following slide, colleagues, um, I, I, I think Dr. Matrigo has already outlined quite a very rich and comprehensive um, background regarding what we are really focusing on um, um, in terms of the background and the contested context that we are facing and really what we are trying to achieve um, in this paper. So what, 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 what to synchronize and to summarize what Dr. McElgo and I are trying to do in this paper is that colleagues, we are deliberately adopting uh, what we see as an ideological um, perspective in arguing uh, for the importance of excess and success for black students uh, in higher education. We've already mapped out the fees must fall, roads must fall, um, the calls for epistemic freedom, the neoliberal university, all the structural macro and as well as macro challenges uh, that the sector is facing. And so in this paper, we A, take on the pattern uh, of picking up on those ideological issues that the South African higher education sector is facing. Uh, but B, and here is where we put our necks on the line, we begin to do something a little bit different uh, by thinking through theorizing and conceptualizing uh, the way that we understand um, access. I think Dr. Matthew has already mentioned uh, how access for us is not only just um, 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 formal, you are registered now, you are part of the university, and so physically and formally, um, you are deemed to be uh, to have access to the university. But we know from the late Wally Moro and others that there's the secondary access um, component uh, that comes. Yes, you may be registered. Yes, you may have that first year. Um, um, but also, do they also have uh, what Moro called the epistemological access, access to the curriculum goods? Um, access to the knowledge is within um, um, the university, within the curricula. So that's what Dr. Makugo and I are really doing, is to formulate and understand access um, in the epistemic sense. So that's firstly accessing the knowledge and curricula, and we are arguing that students need to have this access and some of the interventions that we can begin to think about to respond to this. Secondly, we speak about cultural access, and, and here is where we begin um, to draw around issues of institutional culture, belonging, non-belonging, issues that are beyond the curriculum colleagues, because we recognize, as our colleagues said earlier this morning, that our students 
uh, uh, what Chrissy Bowie and Sue McKenna called uh, social beings. So they exist over and above the curriculum. So they have to navigate and negotiate their being and belonging uh, uh, and becoming, if you like, um, in the university. So there's also the cultural sense, I suppose. And then finally, we cannot ignore the economic sense um, and that our students have. So colleagues, please keep that in mind, because in our paper, that's how we formulate and theorize um, access. It's access through the epistemic sense, it's access in the cultural sense, and finally access in the material money um, 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 physical sense. And, and we relied, and this is just a side debate that Dr. Maklugo and I um, had, we initially relied on Gramsci because not only because we like him, um, <laughs> in terms of the ideas of the hegemon and the organic crisis and others, but we found Nancy's phrase a social justice framework uh, and the ideas of participatory parity, um, and ensuring that individuals compete on equal footing in society, we found those ideas to be very, very attractive. And so really in the next slide, that became sort of like our theoretical lenses um, that we adopted and used um, um, in this study. And really colleagues, all that framework really says uh, is that um, um, justice and uh, could really be understood uh, through the economic sense, through the cultural sense, as well as through the, uh, 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 the political sense, at least according to Nancy Fraser. And for the, the, the beginning part of her research, uh, around the social justice framework. I think Nancy Fraser focused mostly on the economic and the cultural, and I think it's in the latter part of her research uh, where the political um, 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 stuff started to gain traction, um, and she started adding the third dimension to her, uh, to her framework, and this is where we begin to see the political. The economic really is about the redistribution, redistributing resources in an equitable way. And so for her, injustice would be as a result of the maladministration uh, uh, of the different ways in which resources are distributed and the way they facilitate and enable inequality. In the sense or in the cultural dimension uh, of social justice, at least for Nancy Fraser, this is where we begin to see the importance of people being recognized. And Nancy, I think, is much more specific about the way she understands recognition. It's about recognizing people as valued, respected, esteemed um, 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 being. And the injustice for is where we begin to misrecognize um, 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 people, right? This is where we begin to not take them seriously. We do not begin to appreciate them and their attributes and practices and others are given some of those inequality and not um, considered. And then finally, for, 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 for Fraser's framework, uh, where she speaks about political justice in that sense, uh, that's where issues of representation and belonging in these organizations, um, 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 what your Gramsci would call the totality block uh, and formalized authority. So that for Nancy Fraser would be people being recognized um, 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 in society, right? Um, and so the reframing would be the parity of those rights and people having equal protection and people having equal representation within the formal um, 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 political system. And the misrepresentation and the misreading to some extent, at least in the Frasian sense, is where we would see people uh, are, are lacking and being seen and being read uh, to not be taken serious in terms of their norms, their policy, uh, their discourses. I think it was the post-colonial thinker, Kayatri Spivak, who asked whether the subaltern can speak. So I suppose Fraser would draw, would draw on that Spivak conception around people, whether they have the ability and the capacity to speak, or are we deliberately mishearing them? And that is our argument with Dr. Matrigo um, um, in this paper. Uh, the sense that people are deliberately not, Black students in uh, specifically are not being uh, seen, they're not being recognized, um, they're not being valued, um, they're not being uh, 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 appreciated uh, uh, as well. And so really, as I've mentioned, colleagues, epistemic access, and this is really um, 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 uh, where we begin. So for us, access, when you speak about access and success for students and what are some of the possible intervention, epistemic access really, and remember access, epistemic access refers to access to the curriculum knowledge, access to the knowledge, access to the intellectual goods uh, of the university. And this is where we argue with Dr. McGregor that we need to incorporate some of the rich and exciting and diverse indigenous knowledge systems, some of them coming from the global south through the Caribbean Philosophical Association, African Americana uh, uh, studies um, from, from indigenous knowledge systems and others uh, that could be recentered, replaced and recentered uh, and reprioritized 
uh, in higher education. And we argue that those continue to be marginalized and perhaps possibly that's one of the reasons that uh, we still have that 7% that is still struggling to access the curriculum goods. It may very well be that the curriculum is not only alienating and colonizing, it's a curricula that does not talk to or speak directly to their lived experience. And so we need to recenter some of these epistemic traditions. And I'm very careful, colleagues, because we always receive these critiques that we are trying to throw away these dead white men. We don't like them. We hate them. And we are trying to push them to the dustbins of history. We like our Kramsky. We like our Foucault. We like our Habermas. Uh, we like our Heidegger. <laughs> Even though Habermas, I think, is still alive. We like some of these um, 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 white men, white straight men who are scholars and philosophers. All that we are saying is, is that we need to be faithful to what the decolonial scholar uh, Povechato Santos calls the ecologies of knowledge, right? Where we think together and these knowledges coexist together uh, in curricula. One does not have to assume what somebody calls epistemic supremacy over the other. And we argue in this paper, ideologically so, uh, that uh, African knowledge systems continue to be marginalized and relegated and dispossessed to the margins uh, uh, of the academy. And so in the interest of time, I'll move to the cultural access. And this is where really we begin uh, to look at the socio-political and social dislocation that not only black students, but also black academics and others continue to feel that they are isolated, marginalized, mentally abused and dislocated uh, from the broader institutional culture. And the dominance of this, of course, comes from our research intensive universities, as well as our historically white universities, as well as historically African university. And so black students begin to, uh, to lament, to argue, to critique um, um, around the issues of this hegemonic institutional culture and space and spatiality as well that serves as an existential ontological epistemic reminder that a they do not belong it's not their university it would never be their university and of course pedro chabinsky and Selimetis over there in 2015 wrote an entire book around being at home and the sense that black students and black academics continue to feel marginalized uh, by the institutional culture and how there is a growing mismatch between the ambitious. I, 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 I note you, uh, Delisha, I, I, I note you, uh, and, and I promise you I'm not going to go overboard. Um, and this is where they begin to map for us colleagues the mismatch and the disjuncture and the disconnection between the ambitious policy framework that you find, whether it's in the white paper three, whether it's in the Sudin report, whether it's in the higher education uh, 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 act, or whether it's the institutional policy documents uh, that the different universities have around transformation, reform, or decolonization, and really what's happening on the ground. And this is where we argue that part of a true commitment to access a successful student, remember, they're not just curriculum beans. These are social beans that we have to engage with in the university. Cultural access has to be part and parcel uh, 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 of that um, um, conversation uh, that we're engaging. I'm not, and we are not disproving the importance of curriculum interventions. We are merely just highlighting that the cultural aspect has to be recentered. And so in the next slide, Dr. Matigo, maybe you can jump this one in the interest of time. This is where Malaika Azania, another black activist, another black scholar was beginning to write. And I think she puts it much more brutally than I do where she calls these historically white universities, these research intensive universities, what I think Dr. Matigo called uh, the cream de la creme of the higher education sector. Although I critique that around what that means as, as those of us who are working within decolonial scholarship. Uh, but, but I think Malaika is much more brutal than us here, where she calls these universities uh, 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 as abattoirs to which black students are sent to be slaughtered. And of course, the point for Malaika wa Azania is not slaughtered, of course, in the physical sense, but she means it in the hermeneutical sense, in the existential sense, in the metaphysical sense, in the spiritual sense, in the mental sense, in terms of dealing and grappling uh, with those challenges. And finally, Dr. Matilde, if you can rush to the economic um, um, access that is so very, very important before I conclude is that another issue that we are facing colleagues is the issue of hunger, homelessness, and some of the students that are still continuing to sleep in computer laboratories um, on university campus. Yes, this is true, post fees must fall, post roads must fall, hunger is still a real and material challenge. And we cannot only be thinking about how students can successfully grapple with curricula while we're ignoring these pressing agent uh, necessary uh, issues, and as well as the, the declining national funding that we are receiving uh, from the Department of Higher Education 
uh, 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 and training. Perhaps Dr. Dr. Makigo, just go to the, the parting shots there where we reach our conclusion. And then I think I would wrap up in less than 20 seconds uh, deletion. And so what are the parting shots colleagues that we are leaving with, uh, that we are leaving you with in this paper is that A, we need to remember that the South African higher education sector, like its counterparts in the global South is a changing and complex uh, 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 sector. We have to think seriously about inequality and the discourse around the fourth industrial revolution. To what extent do we really live? Some parts of this country, UK, and you are involved. Um, 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 we still have students who are coming from backgrounds where they are still living in the first industrial revolution. So there is that tension that we need to, to mitigate. We are living in the neoliberal university as well, where performance management, teaching, publishing, publish or perish, and others have implications where academic speed. I focus on research, Mlamuli, I don't want to do teaching and teaching as a result is being dumped down to junior academic staff members who have to carry the bulk of the load. In terms of meaningful teaching, in terms of emancipatory teaching, in terms of productive and fruitful teaching, what does that, what are the implications of that uh, for students accessing um, um, the curriculum. And of course, for future research, I think it's absolutely important that colleagues begin to take up the baton and tease out access. Yes, formal access is important. Uh, yes, epistemic access is important, but you also need to start thinking around some of the um, interventions and markers we can create that can be intersectional in capturing the different kinds of access that students, Black students in particular, need at university. Delicia, for the sake of our safety, we'll stop now and we'll see if we have any questions. Please. Please, thank you very much, Mlamuli and Luisa. Let's show our appreciation to the two speakers, uh, uh, giving them some. Thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, can I ask that maybe we just hold some questions so that we can afford other present uh, presenters enough time? Um, and so what we'll do, if you have any questions for uh, Mlamuli and Luisa, you can put them in the chat and we'll try and, and, and capture them as we go along. Our next... Um, presentation is by Randir Rawatlal and Ashton Mahiri. Um, Ashton and, and Randir will speak on data democracy, a shared platform for the managed exposure of institutional research records. Uh, thank you very much, Randir. And Ashton is from DUT, Randir from UKZN. Thank you so much. Again, five minutes before time, I will come on the screen and, and try um, to guide you along. Thank you. Let us start. Thanks very much, Delisha. And uh, 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 please tell me, is uh, the full screen version of this presentation visible? Yes, it is. It is. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Um, so this term, data democracy, um, it's something that I think I first heard uh, when Ashton was speaking to someone else at the SAA conference we both uh, attended. And uh, it, it really stuck with me because uh, I realized that was um, a, a kind of fundamental piece of things we were both involved with. And uh, as many of you know, uh, I do work on the Auto Scholar Advisor System, and we'll see uh, how that plays into that. Um, so just going straight into it. Um, sorry, this little bar here. OK. So, so if you look at what the discourse is around institutional research, quite often what we are trying to share are ideas. And sometimes we say we share methods, but quite often it's the idea behind the, the methods that we are sharing. And in a way, um, this is not everything that's possible. So if you look at what's possible today in the cloud enabled world, the sharing can go beyond ideas. It can go to the practicalities of sharing methods, of actually sharing a method that someone can immediately use. And as part of that, we are all developing models that help us predict how our students will perform and help us optimize uh, the way that we, um, we present our curricula. And uh, the previous speakers have touched on that. And so it is possible for us to create these forms of support. But when we do that, we, of course, um, we produce better models when we have large sets of data and when we have large variance in that data, a large amount of variety in that data. And that starts to touch on that can we achieve a data set that cuts across institutions? 
So of course, in a single institution, you can cut across faculties and the difference between STEM and non-STEM and, and all of that. But what about across whole institutions? What about models that fit across um, the whole country? And when you start thinking about such things, then you run into the concerns about, well, how do you do this in a real sense, right? If you want to create this massive data set that lets you create a model that fits across a whole country, then of course the issues become uh, poppy or Popeye as some people say, and then uh, there's uh, in the US it's FERPA. So how do you respect the privacy of uh, personal information? Um, and not just in letter, we don't want to view it just as a constraint. We also appreciate the sensitivities around sharing of data. So how do you maintain your, your respect for these protocols, both in the letter and in spirit? And so in, in fact, these two things, the interest in creating a, a national framework and the national uh, scale model, and uh, respecting uh, the privacy of information, those seem to be quite, um, uh, quite contradictory principles to uphold at the same time. So we want to look in this presentation at uh, the possibilities around this. And towards that, we want to start first by asking everyone what your opinion is about this. So we'll be running a poll, we'll be running, a, well, the same poll twice during this presentation. And to access this poll, uh, you would go to this uh, address. So please excuse me, I'm just going to copy this address into the chat for uh, your ease. And there's chat. Great, thanks, Ashton's done it already, thanks. Okay. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, the QR code for that link is also here. So please visit that link. And you'll see here in the poll, it, uh, it talks about supporting institutional research. So to support institutional research, at what stage would you share uh, data that you have available to yourself? So let's say you have a table of student records and the student names and the student number and all of that is in there. So at what stage would you share this data with a third party? So it may be another institutional researcher, let's say at a different institution. And uh, here are the options. So you just go ahead and click on one of these. So uh, would you just go ahead and share the data as it is? Then the obvious um, uh, semi-solution to this is uh, to anonymize the data. So would you anonymize the data, for example, by encryption? Would you anonymize it by hashing, by salted hashing? And, uh, or would you do it by salted hashing and shifting marks? So of course, all of these are uh, things that we'll cover during the presentation. So we'll define exactly what all that means. And then the last one is I would never grant access. So please go ahead and choose one of these and then uh, just click on submit answers. Right, um, and if you like, uh, please go ahead and write a comment in there as well. So if you just take a minute, click on the link, just uh, choose one of these options. And if you'd like, you can write a, a short comment as well and then submit that. And then we'll be having a look at these results at the end of this presentation. Okay. So, uh, so just to mention some of my interests in this topic of uh, data democracy from the side of the Auto Scholar, right? In the Auto Scholar, uh, for those of you who haven't met it before, uh, the Auto Scholar is a system that uses artificial intelligence and basic stats and, and gamification and other things to encourage students on a path that, is, uh, that gives them a better chance at graduation. So it's trying to improve the throughput rates and the Auto Scholar started out uh, when I was a staff, staff member at UCT. We started writing the functionality around that. And then uh, when I moved to KZN, then we applied it at DUT and then uh, at UKZN and now CPUT. And so while we were doing all this, um, the challenges were that there are so many differences that arise when you are trying to implement one solution across multiple institutions. So of course you have the institutional classification, so a traditional university versus uh, UOT and TVET. 
So uh, there's that, but to be honest, the differences didn't so much arise uh, anything to do with that. Uh, sometimes though, there are differences in the definition. So we think we know what it means when we say graduation rate, but then are you basing that on the students that have been in the system past a certain point? Are you basing that on all the students who registered uh, to enter? Are you basing it on those who actually attended? So uh, your differences in definition can challenge your attempt to deliver functionality across multiple institutions. You've got different financial drivers. So uh, especially if you look at public and private institutions and there are new entrants uh, to the auto scholar user base. Uh, so there are different financial drivers. And um, in that case, you might be optimizing for the wrong thing. So the functionality that's being delivered might not be suitable if the financial driver is different for the institution. And then the most obvious one, the data structure is, is all different. So at one institution, the student records are called stu rec something. And then at another one, it's, uh, it, it's something else. So the names of the tables and then the fields in which they are captured are, are, are different. So uh, the data structure is different. Um, and then you've also got differences in the way the data is stored. So, um, so you may have different types of database. You've got MySQL databases, Postgres, but even looking past that kind of very clear uh, um, difference in the way that you store data, in some institutions, still quite a lot of the data is sitting in Excel spreadsheets, right? You'd be quite shocked at, uh, the, um, at, at the media that um, sometimes critical data is stored. Um, in some places, uh, it's still paper-based. Uh, some places don't have any uh, computing infrastructure. Um, so uh, how do you cope with all these different media and these different ways of storing data? And then, of course, we've uh, mentioned about the puppy compliance. So this is kind of emphasizing the same point. Um, and it's just to say, this goal then of um, of achieving some kind of national model or a, a national approach to anything uh, doesn't even appear to be practical. Uh, practical. Um, so let alone uh, the issues associated with privacy of data, right? Before we even get to that point, just the practicality of doing this in the first place, uh, it seems to be a major challenge. But when you start looking in the modern computing approaches, you start to find uh, some solutions that appear. So for example, the, the obvious one of the data structure being different. So you have what are known as database views. So whatever your institution's data structure is, if you have a database view in place, then that will help translate your uh, institution's uh, data format into a different format that might be what something like the auto scholar is expecting. So it can help you restructure your data. You can also uh, have a kind of a server sitting between the database and the user. So through a proxy server, you can do some processing of data so that it's friendlier to the format of interest. And then uh, application programming interfaces. Uh, that's something that we'll show in, in more detail just now. Uh, we've already mentioned some of these things. So that's uh, from uh, just an ed tech perspective, uh, the auto scholar needs to deliver consistent functionality in the face of uh, these types of challenges. So to uh, one of the solutions towards that, um, you can see here uh, the application programming interface. Uh, so uh, taking a restaurant analogy, if uh, you are a customer uh, at a restaurant, then when you uh, order a meal, number one, uh, you are given a, a menu and, and you make your selection there. Then the waiter uh, will uh, convert that order into the form that the kitchen expects. So it explains to the kitchen, uh, this customer wants uh, this dish, but then customized in these ways. And then uh, the kitchen uh, generates the meal and then the waiter uh, returns it to the customer. And that's largely how APIs work. So here's an example of the Autoscholar API. So the user is sitting here with the, his or her browser, 
And as they are clicking around and accessing uh, analysis uh, from the Auto Scholar, that is sending requests to the API. So the API is software that's sitting on a server, like an institution server. So this is happening on the back end. On the front end, you are logging in and you are asking, uh, what's the best way for me to graduate? Then that question is converted into data and that's sent to the institution's API. And then as part of answering that question, that API will further send a request for data about that user to the institution's database. That comes back, the API figures out what uh, response to return to that user. So that's how an API can work. And it's in this API that you can encode the translation of the institution structure of the data into the data structure that you are requiring, uh, for example, by the Autoscholar. So the API resolves many of these problems for us. And in the case of the Autoscholar, we have the one Autoscholar code base and we just write a different API for each institution. And we've had people uh, just shocked that it worked as easily as that. So this is something we've done several times now. Um, you write the API and it delivers uh, Autoscholar functionality or whatever uh, software it is you're using. And then um, sometimes uh, the question arises, quite often the question arises, so you're going to copy our university's database and that's how it's going to work. And no, it, it doesn't work that way. The university's uh, data is sitting with the university. At no stage do we try to copy it, for example, to an Autoscholar server. And uh, th that allows me to say something like this, right? I don't want your data. I don't want to make a copy of your terabytes of data because that's going to cost me to host it on a cloud server and things like that. So that's the beauty of these APIs. It allows you to leave the data where it is without the need to move it or copy it anywhere else. And so all the data stays in a closed loop between the university and the user. And so an institution user can access their data and, and all those transfers can happen without ever leaking that to the outside world. So uh, there's an API specification, and in version two, it's even easier to create these APIs. And I'm just skipping past that. So to say, um, so that solves part of the problem, right? Uh, it is possible now to have APIs translating data for us, but then what about the next question? What about uh, if you want to then share data across multiple institutions, um, how can you do that in the face of, uh, of Puppy and FERPA and things like that? So uh, here are some possible concepts. Um, encryption, right? So if you are thinking about anonymization, um, if you encrypt any data, then it's possible to decrypt it as well, right? So encryption and hashing are two different concepts. So in encryption, you have a key and you have your data and you use that key to encrypt the data. You typically transmit the data somewhere else and then you decrypt that data. So it is possible to decrypt. In hashing, it's not possible to decrypt. So in hashing, you hash the data and it, uh, it comes out as kind of garbled text and you can never unhash that. Well. Uh, not within the lifetime of the known universe, as, as many um, uh, promoters of various hashing algorithms like to say, but um, it's, it's been calculated how much computing power and, and it's not really possible. Um, so, um, so you can hash the student names and student numbers. And the reason that you would want to do that um, and, and not just, uh, uh, for example, delete them, is because quite often you want to cross-reference that data. So if you want to pull up all the records um, or if you want to analyze all the records of a particular student, and if you've already gone and stripped out all the names and student numbers, it's not really possible to put together all, the, um, all that student's records. Um, and so you hash because it at least gives you some key back that then you can use for cross-referencing and, and for collecting data and things like that. And just by way of example of how effective hashing is, here's a simple example. 
uh, here in A1, we've got a long string um, of text. And, um, and then we've got a second string here as well. And the only difference between these two strings is here, uh, this one has a minus at the end and this one has a plus. And then if we hash it using secure hashing algorithm 256 for the number of bytes it uses, you'll see this is the first hash and this is the second one. So even though there's such a small difference, it's not the case that um, if it's a small difference, you get um, a smaller uh, uh, difference hash. Your hashes are completely different even for very small or very large changes, uh, you get completely different hashes. So that looks like a win then. That looks like that's the right way to anonymize our data. So, so then you might want to rethink uh, your earlier answer. Would you then share data a table of records if you had hashed uh, the student names and student numbers? And the complication is that you have uh, what's known as rainbow tables. So a rainbow table, that sounds like something that, uh, it sounds like a very uh, kind of code hacker world type of thing, but it basically means that you can pre-compute all the hashes. So for example, if you've got all the student numbers and we know our student numbers don't change that much. It's uh, typically a nine digit number and it, uh, it's probably a, a couple of hundred thousand possible numbers. So you could just generate an entire list of student numbers, and then you can generate the hash for that. And so now you have a lookup table. And so if you are given a hash table of data, uh, you can just say, well, uh, here's the hash of the student number. I can just look in my generator table at uh, the corresponding number, and then you've managed to dehash it. So um, a rainbow table um, makes it seem as if hashing then uh, is, is not a solution. But you see, instead of storing just the student number, typically what you would do is add another small string to whatever it is you're trying to hash. And so you salt the argument, you salt the thing you are trying to hash with a small string. And it's, uh, it's estimated that even a small string like this um, to generate the rainbow tables uh, for this case, would take uh, more hard drive space than has ever been created on Earth. So, um, so salting uh, the, the hash will allow us uh, uh, consistent anonymization, which is still considered quite, um, quite secure. Um, so uh, I'll just skip over this in the interest of time and then uh, hand you over to Ashton to take us through the second poll there. Great, thanks very much for that. I've just gone and pasted the second poll into the chat. Um, so again, it's asking the same question, but now we've got a better idea of the differences between encryption, secure hashing, salted hashing. So if you wouldn't mind, please just clicking on the link in the chat and going in and completing the poll again. Okay, thanks very much, Randit. If we can move to the next slide. So when I was training DUT staff to use Autoscholar and trying to explain what it is, this API is, um, this was how I illustrated it to the staff and that we've got our students um, database where the information is stored on ITS. We then have these DUT APIs that speak to and connect to Autoscholar. Um, and very important to keep in mind, and I always stress this to the staff, is that Autoscholar is a tool. It doesn't make the decisions for you. Ultimately, it is still up to you as the lecturers to use Autoscholar as a tool. And ultimately, why we're using it is to improve our throughput rates, um, to do our student success analytics, and in order to get our students through the system while still ensuring that they are um, meeting the criteria for graduation and employable. Okay, thanks. So if we move on to the next slide. So this is now just trying to conceptualize it again, what we're talking about when it comes to a shared or a national institutional research, possibly a learning analytics platform. 
Um, you would have all of the different institutions connecting via their APIs into Autoscholar. And then from there, there are various users. And this is why we would want to share the data is that there's got to be some benefit to us. Um, the benefit to the lecturers in terms of the student tracking, the benefit to the students themselves, there's going to be benefit back to the higher education institutions, back again to your institutional researchers who would be able to go in and look at it in a bit more detail and see what are the trends, what is it that the data is showing. And lastly, again, the benefit to government itself. You would have seen that um, DHET as well when they're doing their cohort studies, it is very much aggregated and descriptive in nature. And we haven't yet made that shift to moving towards the predictive um, side in our cohort analysis that we do. Thanks very much. The next slide. Five minutes. So I quickly wanted to reflect on this concept of data democracy when we were training staff to use Autoscholar at BUT. So in terms of data democracy, we really see it as that as IR practitioners, our role at the institution is to make data available to decision makers when they are making their decisions. So it's really about creating access to data and making sure that that data is reliable. My experience was that staff were really uncomfortable having access to data when they previously did not. And this was quite overwhelming to them, especially if it wasn't paired with having the skills to be able to interpret the data as well as the agency to act on the data. Once staff were comfortable with accessing the data, suddenly their appetite for data increased quite drastically and they wanted more and more data to use in their decision making. So it's definitely not a situation where you have once off access um, and then you're happy. Once you've got access to data, you want more and more. In terms of the popia and the ethics, staff really should be asking questions about this. I really enjoyed the training with our humanities faculties because they were really concerned about the ethical use of the student data, which is encouraging to see. Um, when it comes to ethics, you know, if we are predicting that students are failing, then ethically and morally, you're bound to act on it before the students fail. So that whole see something, do something. Um, if you've got access to the data, you're ethically bound to act, to act on it. And it's also about using data for its intended purpose. So student data for student tracking and to improve the scholarship of TNL. It's not to use this data for its um, purposes for other than what it was intended for. In terms of the data governance at DUT, we originally had it what the scholar reading directly to ITS. Now we've got a different situation where ITS produces views and from these view tables, both Power Heater and Autoscholar are using th those view tables. So we've got a bit of um, separation. However, moving forward, we're going to go back towards an integrated system. So we want all of our IT systems to be integrated and to speak to each other. So with our new ERP system coming in next year, being cloud-based as well, we want it to be speaking directly because we want that real-time reporting. We were happy with the having a 24 hour delay in reporting previously, but now we want real time data reporting. Um, so that's also how the appetite has changed. It's not just more data that we want, it's we want real time data so that we can base our decisions on real time data. Okay, so that's it from my side. Um, I'm just wondering if I can maybe share the screen from my side to just show you what the poll results are looking like. So there's the thank you. Um, okay, Randy's also got it from her side, the thank you and the invitation. So now we're quickly going to have a look at the results so far. So this was the first poll. And what we can see there quite nicely is that more than 50% um, would be willing to share their data for institutional research purpose or learning analytics purposes provided that the student names and the student numbers are encrypted. So that was at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and one person saying they would never grant access. Okay. So if we move on to the next, um, the next poll, which we did later on. 
suddenly we see there's a lot more um, knowledge, the differences between encryption versus secure hashing versus salted hashing. We're now seeing, although we've got less respondents, we're now seeing that more people are leaning towards the secure, well, the salted hashing and the secure hashing. So no longer just encrypting the data, but having more advanced um, techniques to anonymize the student names and the student numbers. And one person asking, why do we actually need the student name? <laughs> and interesting to see that in terms of the person who said they would no longer grant access, hopefully that's now changed. And they were one of the people who did the poll again. And based on seeing the benefits of sharing data, they've now changed their impression around sharing it. Thanks very much for that. Um, if I can hand over to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ashton and Randir. A show appreciation to Ashton and Randir for their presentation and for keeping to, to time as you did. I'll allow one or two questions. Is there any questions, any hands up? Um, there's nothing in the chat at the moment. Any questions? No questions at the moment, but thank you very much. And thank you for increasing my knowledge uh, with encryption and secure hashing and, and, and thanks a million for that. We will now go on to our third presentation in the session. And the third presentation is by Randir and um, uh, Rabi at this point, both from UKZN. Randir and Rabi speaking about identifying course combinations that inhibit minimum time graduation, a student population balance approach. Thank you, Randir and, and Rabi. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Once again, I request to the pot, uh, anybody on the chat, please to post your questions and comments on the chat. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks very much, uh, Delicia. Um, so population balances uh, are, um, are things I've worked on for some time uh, from my background in chemical engineering. And uh, it, it's something that I, um, I, I always think about when trying to understand student populations and the movement and even when it comes to things like pass rates and failout rates and exclusions and so on. So population balances, uh, that's always been in the background of my thinking. And uh, um, it, it's always something that I've shied away from. Uh, that, uh, uh, so this is in a way the kind of no apologies uh, view of student populations and, and direct application. Um, so, uh, a population balance uh, is uh, given by this equation. And uh, even though it might look quite uh, weird with all those Greek symbols and so on, there are just a few parts uh, to this that we can think about. And even if we think about um, a, a human population, like the population in this room, so in this Zoom room, so we've all entered uh, this, uh, this room at a certain time. So uh, we would regard our entrance into this room as our birth rate um, into the population space. And then maybe some people saw, oh no, they're talking about population balances and, and so people started to exit. Then there's a certain death rate from that population space as well. And then together with birth and death, there are certain properties of the members of that population that are changing with time. So, for example, if you think about your level of boredom in a, in a presentation, so it might be that when you enter the population space, you have a certain level of boredom, which is quite low. And then depending on how interested you are in the topic, your level of boredom may change with time. So the alpha are the characteristics of the member of that population. And then the birth rate and the death rate, uh, the entrance and exit from that population, and so this equation links those three things together, right? The rate of change with time of the characteristic of the member, the entrance and the exit. So those three things are linked together to give us the rate of change with time of the probability density function. 
So if you look in this room right now, there's a certain distribution of boredom. So there are some people who are very bored, some people who are middling bored, and some people are not bored at all and stimulated by population balances. So there's a distribution of uh, the boredom level. So psi here is that distribution. So we want to know how is this distribution changing over time? So that's what we are doing in population balances. Um, and you can have uh, any uh, number of characteristics. It could be you are mapping a population, the, the height of the members, the weight, the intelligence level. So there are all these possibilities in terms of uh, populations. One minute, are you, are you sharing slides? Uh, sorry. Because uh, oh. we're not <laughs> seeing any slides at the moment. Oh, sorry about that. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, so that's the Thanks. population balance equation and I was po pointing to the birth and death rates and psi is the density distribution. So you've got your distribution of your property and, um, and so we want to know how does that uh, probability distribution change with time as a function of the properties of interest. So alpha are the properties of interest. And so that's in general population balances, and it's uh, tremendously useful in chemical engineering, especially if you have particle systems and so on. And in the case of, uh, of students and uh, applying that to student progression, you can talk about the birth and death of students from a curriculum um, so you are typically born into a curriculum when you are admitted to study there, and then you die out of that curriculum when uh, you might be excluded or when you graduate. So, um, so you've got birth and death rates there. Um, then you have the rate of change with time of your properties. So let's say your properties, your number of credits uh, that you've passed. So your credits will change at different instants in time uh, as you progress through this curriculum, right? And so in a sim simple academic program, you've got one entry point and you've got one exit point and you may also have recycles. And uh, yeah, the discussion can get quite metaphysical. Um, you could model recycles also as a rebirth or yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I take a risk of, uh, I, I take some risks in, in pointing some of these things out. So in chemical engineering, we accept recycles without problem. And uh, if you look at a student who is, um, who has, uh, he's completed a semester, but hasn't passed everything in that semester, then we regard that as a student recycling around uh, in that uh, instant in the, in the curriculum. So there exists a probability that uh, a probability distribution of credits and when those will be passed and, and so on. And uh, the, the key point here is to be able to estimate the rate of change of the credits by the student. So the birth rate is uh, not really considered a challenging part. We can simply estimate, uh, we can uh, get the number of students who are enrolling in an academic program. And then uh, we try to model uh, the probability of the exits by the different means. Um, but the, the really challenging one is how fast are students accumulating credits in this academic program? Um, so this model in particular, if this can be cracked, then we can easily have a population balance that tells us everything we need to know about the program. So uh, that's just a bigger view of that picture. And so the difficulty with trying to figure out the rate at which students accumulate credits is that it depends on many other characteristics. And it's not just about the student, right? So the, the student's level of preparation and uh, the student's uh, level of diligence and all those things, uh, those influence the rate at which a student is accumulating credits. It's also a function of the way the curriculum is operated. So number one, the design of that curriculum as the first speakers of the session uh, uh, spoke about, uh, the design of the curriculum influences your rate at which uh, you are passing through it. 
um, the way the curriculum is delivered. So all those types of aspects uh, also influence it. So it's not only affected by alpha, it's affected by the environment as well, any population. It's influenced by the characteristics of the members of the population, but also by the characteristics of the environment. And so what we can do is develop models that tell us the rate of change of uh, whatever characteristics there are of the members. And we can, of course, go the full-on machine learning route. And for this study, in terms of the results I'll be showing here, I didn't want to use machine learning. In a way, it's too accurate. You, you can fit things to very high levels of accuracy. And what we want to do in this presentation is compare different approaches to developing these models of individual students. So we are going to use simple multilinear regression instead of machine learning, and that will be a way to compare things. Um, Okay, and to do this, you have a, a number of choices to make when developing a model that predicts the student's likelihood of success or their rate of credit accumulation. One is you can develop models that are quite specific to the program. So you can say, well, if I look up for this course in particular, for this module, if I look up the prerequisites for this module, and then I, I just correlate um, those, uh, those results, the prerequisites results. If I correlate that with the performance in this course, then I can create a model. And yes, you can do that, but you see the problem quite often is that that is a very specific relationship, right? When you correlate your prerequisites with uh, your, your current course, there are a number of other factors that influence it. So for example, the lecturer may have changed and uh, there's a different way of delivering that content. Um, it might be that something like uh, COVID has come about. And, and so there are all these other factors at play that limit the persistence of that model. So you can create a model for one year. You can fit everything to 100% in a particular year but that model will be practically worthless in the next year because the relationships have shifted. So that is the difficulty with working with highly specific uh, data and highly specific relationships. So instead, what we like to do is work in terms of uh, what are called latent factors. And uh, the term latent factor doesn't say too much. Uh, what we are trying to do there is work with the fundamentals at play. So instead of putting a student's specific results uh, for a specific module to try to predict a specific mod module, you often want instead to get a general sense about that student. So how does the student perform when the credit load is, uh, is in total, uh, let's say, uh, 20 credits compared with when it's 80 credits? So different students respond differently. Sometimes. Um, having more credits is better because you see the big picture and you're able to progress your studies better. So you get all these sorts of uh, counterintuitive influences. And so by working through latent factors, you begin to generalize what you can do. So there are latent factors to students. And uh, in the study, what we did was um, we took a large data set, thousands and thousands of academic records, and we partitioned those into different semesters. And in each semester for each student, we worked out various uh, basic stats. So uh, how many credits did you undertake? Uh, what were the number of credits you actually passed? What was your mean result there? And so for each student, we had those metrics for each semester. Um, so it wasn't just on a, on a course level, it was on a semester level. And then we looked for each student across those semesters at those metrics. And we did metrics on those metrics. So what was the rate at which your, your mean mark was uh, increasing or decreasing? What was the mean of your mean mark? What was the standard deviation of your mean? So we tried to get to really fundamental uh, metrics uh, about the students. And by the same token, we did that on the coursework as well. We tried to get to the metrics of the metrics of the course. So um, 
in this course over the years, what has been the tendency for the results to shift in comparison with what the other uh, uh, results uh, with, um, with how the students are doing in the other courses. And uh, these are the results that are shown for the two approaches. So in the first approach, we have the highly specific fit where you've just taken a particular year and you've mapped those results, uh, the prerequisites against the, the performance. And you do get a better initial performance, right? This is the one, uh, this is the latent factor-based approach. My apologies, I didn't title these uh, graphs or plot them on the same axes, but um, your latent factor uh, um, performed worse initially but I think you'll agree in the first case, the, the model wasn't really persistent. You can see its performance is degrading over time. So it went down quite sharply. And so you had a very low uh, Pearson R coefficient uh, just two years later. It improved a bit, but overall that one's going down. In the case of the latent factors, there was one outlier that dragged it right down, but this model is much more persistent. So year on year, it's giving you uh, a, a good level of indication. By the way, a zero means there's a complete scatter and, and there's no way to predict what the students are doing. Uh, above four, uh, 0 0.45 in machine learning, um, you, you start to regard it as a, a, a reasonably good performance. Um, it's doing much better than a coin toss. <laughs> a, a coin toss. <laughs> so here you can see uh, the the highly specific model only lasted two years. Um, and here it, it's lasted much, uh, much longer than that. So uh, latent factors um, that uh, we are proposing as a much better way of developing our models. Um, and by the way, again, this was only done for multilinear regression. We deliberately stayed away from machine learning because then it becomes too accurate and and then it, it really starts to look like latent factor. It, it wouldn't be a fair comparison if we did it purely as machine learning. Um, so then, of course, the next step is to take that approach and apply it to machine learning. And then if you do that, um, you find, uh, so this is just mentioning the difference between regression and machine learning. So in regression, you are trying to fit the entire uh, continuum of values. Whereas in machine learning, quite often you have a classification of true and false. So did the student uh, pass or fail? So uh, machine learning is quite discrete, um, right? In the sense of uh, uh, fixed sets of numbers, whereas regression is quite often uh, on continuous numbers. And because machine learning tends to be discrete and it's true or false, then it becomes necessary to look at um, to look at these different states. So, if we look at what's called a confusion matrix here, we are trying to figure out how well the model performed. And you've got here the um, this is the uh, false. Uh, let me get this right. Uh, so this is. Uh, the act this was actually false and the model predicted that it was false. And here by true and false, uh, we are trying to predict whether a student is going to pass or fail. So a true means the student is going to fail. So down here, we've got that the model correctly predicted there would be 17 students who would fail and it correctly predicted there are 33 students who would pass, who did go on to pass. Whereas here it predicted there are eight students who, uh, who would fail, but who didn't fail, who did pass. And there are 15 students that the model said would, uh, would pass, but who failed. And so overall, your tendency to evaluate this model would be to say, well, the model's got it right uh, 33 plus 17 times, and it got it wrong eight plus 15 times. And so you would say, well, overall then the accuracy is 68%, and that's much better than a coin toss, so it's a useful model. But you see, you, you also have to think about the application of this model. And if we are using this model to figure out 
recruit students to direct uh, for uh, further advising, then what really matters to you is that you, um, you get it right when the student is going to fail, right? It doesn't matter to you if the student was going to pass and you still advise them to go for uh, counseling. Right in that in a case where the student was going to pass, and you advise them to go uh, for counselling, um, all that's happened is that the student has had extra counselling, and and maybe it helped improve their mark, marks as well. Whereas if you get it wrong when the student was going to fail, if you thought the student was going to pass but they went on to fail, then you've uh, you haven't given them the opportunity of counselling, and 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 so it's much more serious. On, uh, on this row, right? So the, the real um, evaluation of this model, considering the application, considering that you, you want to direct students for counseling, the real estimate of uh, the effectiveness of this model is 17 and 15. And you see, if you compare the 17 and the 15, that's only 53%. It's only slightly better than a coin toss. So this is, is not a good model, right? O originally, if you just look at what's called the accuracy, if you follow the strict definition of accuracy, it, it looks like uh, um, it, it's, a, it's of significant help in identifying students. Whereas if you look at the recall score, uh, this is what we actually need. So, so this, um, this emphasizes something that's emerging more and more in the literature that you can't remove yourself from the context. You have to bear in mind um, what you are using the model for, and then you'll know which metric to use uh, and, and uh, optimize for. Um, and then we showed here that uh, if you use boosting on top of the machine learning, uh, if you, your recall score, you can get fairly good recall scores. Of course, with COVID, uh, that, uh, challenged the models uh, too far then and the recall went down, but uh, you had some good recalls uh, uh, before that. So, uh, so that's in a nutshell uh, how everything fits together. So you, uh, you're trying to develop a population balance model that tells you how the whole curriculum will perform. And then you've got uh, models, uh, you've got different types of models you can create, and you've got different types of metrics that you can pursue. Uh, towards uh, trying to develop an overall good model. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's basically the summary. And then uh, just to invite uh, anyone who'd like to participate in this uh, kind of research uh, to try out these methods. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randir, and thank you for, for keeping time. But there's, some, uh, there's a question in the chat that maybe you'd like to answer from Rohan. How does your equation or models handle students jumping around from courses or jumping around from degrees, transfer students? Thanks, mm -hmm. Randil. Thanks, Delisa, um, and thanks for the question. So in the case of jumping around among courses, um, you see by the latent factor approach, what, what you are doing is extracting the generalized characteristics about a course. So in a way, it doesn't matter what course you jump to, you, you can still uh, course, it will still work with that uh, model. So the, by the latent factor approach, it's possible to use that data. Uh, if you are using specific models, the moment you switch the course, you have no way of correlating data. In terms of, um, of switching across programs, um, yeah, that, that's a harder problem. Uh, we haven't approached that one as yet. So currently we are looking in an academic program uh, at, at how you are, uh, at how the model works. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Randir. Uh, Rohan, are you okay? Do you have any follow-up question or anybody else with a question? We have a few minutes. Um, for more questions or any comments on the presentation. Thank you. you. Can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Uh, 
Okay, Rohan is pleased with uh, answering of the question. Thank you. Thank you, Randir. Uh, um, is there any other last comment you'd like to make, Randir? And then we can go into the next presentation. Uh, maybe to uh, invite Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi told me you, you go for it in this presentation, but um, uh, maybe uh, Rabbi could give us some background also. Uh, hi. Um, Hi, Robbie. Hello. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah, no, th thanks, Randir, for that. Um, it, I know it's highly technical in nature, but um, in, interested individuals don't have to do the technical development. Uh, all of those reside in Auto Scholar and can be utilized with ease. I think the, the, the point that needs to be emphasized is student support is often premised on our hunches and, and speculative beliefs. Uh, what we're trying to do is use a more scientific, reliable approach, uh, which, uh, which sort of diminishes the speculative, uh, speculative aspect of student support. So thanks for that, Anil. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that once again. And indeed, yes, very technical. But that's just really showing us what's happening behind Auto Scholar. So thanks, uh, Randir and Rabbi, for that presentation. We, thanks um, very much. We have, all right. Um, we have a few more minutes, but maybe people can uh, get ready. I don't actually want to start between before 11.40, because just to allow people to come into the session um, for, for the last session. Um, there's a team, Randir, um, are you the only one who's going to be presenting in this? Uh, is one presenter or do you have a team of presenters? Uh, Dr. Kumalo uh, will be the uh, main presenter. I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be making a short presentation in the middle. Okay, all right. So there's, there's uh, more than one presenter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so... Um, our next presentation, then, if they can get ready, uh, Dr. Kumalo, uh, Randir, Victor Dadozi, Cedric Bungoso, uh, Padamile, and Ashni from University of KwaZulu Natal. And, and their topic is Reimagining the Success Discourse in a Higher Education Institution Undergraduate Student Success. So, um, I hand over to you to get yourself ready, get your slides started, and we just on 11.40. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamalo. Kamalo, have you unmuted? Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Can you, you. See my, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much and, and greetings uh, colleagues. My name is uh, Samu Kumalo. Um, sorry about that, that, let me just check this. Would you like to put your video on if you can? Yeah, I'll try to. Just so we see you. Okay, uh, thanks again, colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Samu Kumalo, and uh, I will be presenting together with uh, Professor Rawatlal. And uh, we are part of the, the team, and the team members are here, and they will uh, contribute during the question and answer session. So the title of our project um, and the study that we would like to present today is reimagining the success uh, discourse in higher education, uh, which talks to the undergraduate uh, student success. Sorry, uh, uh, um, Dr. Kumalo, would you like yes. to maybe go on to slideshow? Uh, the, my computer slideshow. is giving me a problem, so, so that is why I've changed to this. And okay, no problem. All right, then it's fine. Carry on. All right, okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, colleagues, just to give you a, a background uh, about our project or our study, uh, starting with the, the access in higher education that 
um, the access in higher education has actually gained a lot of, of traction uh, in South Africa and also worldwide. And the universities in South Africa, they continue to create access opportunities for all, uh, actually including the, the, the students that were previously marginalized during the apartheid era. Um, the dominant discourse, however, it sought to understand the risk factors for the for these students, uh, the students that are actually not performing well uh, or underperforming students, or the students that are named as at risk of academic failure. So not much is known about uh, the students that are gifted or the students that are a high academic uh, performers in terms of what explains their success and um, what is the secret of their success. So the factors that influence uh, their success, it usually it escape the radar and uh, remain unexplored. So while there is a robust discussion on what predicts and enables student success, uh, the gap still exists in knowledge in, in terms of what supports the academically high performing students and what enables their, uh, their success, what are the intervention programs that we need to put in place for them to be able to succeed. Also, if you look at the, the institutional policy, so that is also lacking in terms of including them in the policy in terms of how can we support them is also lacking in our practice in terms of the academic support intervention that we have in high institution. So the student success at this course is being informed by the deficit model and looking at this individual student weaknesses rather than a collective strength. And also often if you look at the intervention strategies that we have in higher education is predominantly reactive in nature and rather than being proactive. So the students that are high, highly performing are excluded from the structured institutional academic support programs. So what we are presenting today is a sub-study within a larger ongoing project in the School of Education. And the, pro the purpose of the, the, the study is to explore the nature of academic highly performing uh, students' experiences of their academic support needs and various ways in which academic support or lack of enables or inhibits their performance at full potential. So the students that were actually uh, our participants or part of the, the study are the students that are on track uh, graduating summa cum laude or cum laude. So in the School of Education, uh, so these students are being tracked monitored and supported. At the beginning of each semester, um, all students that are sitting with a weighted average of 70% and above um, are being identified, uh, tracked and monitored. So once the students are being identified, so the information about where they are at and what is it that they need to do, they are actually sent uh, to student, which is part of the motivation and also congratulations to them uh, regarding their performance. And also the information about uh, the students in order for the lecturers to be able to support them, their information is actually sent to lecturers as well. So what we've seen so far is that once the students uh, receive the letters or information about where they're at uh, in terms of uh, their academic um, success, uh, that they are sitting at 70% and above and they are in, actually in track in terms of uh, the possibility that they can actually graduate summa cum laude or summa cum laude. It actually ignites a lot of motivation from the student side and the excitement. And it also uh, creates a space whereby those students who do not receive those letters they start the conversation and sending us emails in terms of asking questions that if I want to uh, receive this letter, if I want to achieve it at this level, what is it that I need to do? 
Um, the next slide discusses the autoscholar tool, and I'm going to ask a uh, Prof. Randil to take over from here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Samuel. Um, let's see, I'm just going to share screen. Let's see. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is showing the interface for us to do the identification of the sum, uh, summa cum laude and the cum laude students. So um, you, uh, you would specify the cohort of interest. So you specify uh, the program code and the year uh, for that cohort. And then you specify the criteria. So uh, for the cum laude students, uh, you have to maintain a minimum of 75% as your credit weighted average. For the summa cum laude, uh, a minimum of 80%. Um, did I forget to share screen again? No. No, you are sharing, Prof. Thank okay, you. great. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, summa cum laude, uh, 80%. And then um, this we added as an afterthought, and that turned out to be quite significant eventually, but we also just added um, what about criteria for uh, a pass uh, of first class and second class and third class, so we included that. And then some degree programs have additional criteria for cum laude. So it might be that there's a capstone course or capstone event and that you have to have a certain minimum mark uh, to still be cum laude. So you can specify those as well. And then you, you just click on identify cum laude. And the first thing it will do is show you the students still on track for cum laude. So in this program, there were no uh, summa cum laude students and three cum laude. And it's showing here, uh, sorry, it's, um, I hope you can see this, but uh, this is just hashed. We've hashed, uh, if you saw the, the second presentation of the session, uh, we talked about salted hashing. And, and so for this presentation, we've just hashed the student names and student numbers. And uh, the system is uh, pointing out the reasons why these students are still on track for cum laude. So I don't think you can see this, but it's saying here, you've uh, maintained uh, in this year, in this semester, you've maintained a certain minimum. Uh, so your actual average is this value, which is more than or equal to the required value. So it's figured out which uh, the cum laude students are, along with the reasons for them being uh, cum laude or summa cum laude. Um, and then uh, you might also be able to see here, you, um, it says, um, credits passed, and this is saying first class. Uh, yeah, these are all, of course, first class students because they are on track for cum laude. Um, so that's the first thing it does. It tells us which uh, the cum laude students are. And then it goes on to do a couple of other things. It also shows us by how many points a student has missed uh, being cum laude. So this student was on track for cum laude, but then had uh, a mark below 75 in this semester, the student as well. So it gives us a sense for in which semesters uh, students are just missing being cum laude students. So that helps us uh, understand where there may be challenge points in the curriculum. Um, and then uh, in terms of the uh, later parts of the study, which uh, Samu will talk to, uh, we are looking at um, a questionnaire study to understand more about the differences between the cum laude students and the students who don't graduate cum laude. So in identifying those students that just missed it, you can start to figure out the differences also in terms of that other data. Um, so you can identify students who just missed it as well. And then it also shows you which students have not yet graduated. So uh, cum laude and summa cum laude is out of the question for these students now, but it's showing that these students, um, first off, it shows the status of the degree for those students. So for example, this student is uh, on a second class, is on track to graduate with a second class degree. And um, it's saying to the student, you need to, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the student is currently a third class is currently on track to graduate third class, um, but it's saying to the student, 
if you can achieve a slightly higher average of 60% in the remaining 184 credits, then uh, you can get to the second class. So although the project started out looking purely at the cum laude students, it's also looking at for students currently in the system who are not able to get there, um, looking at their current situation, what advice can we give them to upgrade uh, their, uh, their final uh, degree uh, classification? And so this helps to raise their, um, uh, their goals. So instead of the goal being just, well, I've missed every opportunity at cum laude, so I might as well just pass. Instead of that being the approach, it, it gives them a, a more, um, uh, a higher level of detailed goal that I'm currently on third class, I now need to get to second class. And this is what I need to do to get there. So, um, so that's where that led us. And all of that, uh, those views are sitting in the program analyst uh, component of the Auto Scholar. If we go into the equivalent view of that advice under student central, uh, that's another component. Um, then you see it, it's advising the student, you are currently on track for third class and you need to get this average in the remaining credits. So this is a different student. Um, and then it further goes on to look at the courses that the student is currently registered for. So this student is doing a, a number of other courses and looking at the first two here. Uh, the student has already uh, done some assessments in this course. And that has changed the requirement to satisfy this overall um, objective. So the student wants to get from third class to second class. And so they need that average, but they've underperformed in these assessments. So the system is saying, well, there are still these other upcoming assessments. So keep your average uh, to that value, and then you will still be on track to get there. Um, so it's uh, an even higher level of detail. It's, it's telling you down at the course level uh, how you need to do in the remaining assessments to, uh, to get to the uh, higher level uh, of uh, class of pass. Um, okay, and I hand you back uh, to Dr. Kamalo. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I don't know, colleagues, whether you can, <laughs> are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, colleagues, what I'm going to be presenting now, and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rando, is uh, it's, it's work in progress. Um, in, in our project, we use the focus group interviews, uh, the individual questionnaires, as well as the document analysis of the student records. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today are the findings from the focus group interviews. What we are going to do and next is that we will be sending the questionnaire to students that are potential cum laude students and those that are not potential cum laude students so that we can understand their experiences and what kind of support that they need and also what is it that they think uh, they need to do in order for them to to perform at their full potential. So for today's uh, presentation, we will share the findings from the focus group interview uh, with 10 participants uh, who are potential cum laude students uh, who were purposely selected for the case study, which actually allowed us to understand their experiences in depth and also uh, for us to be able to, to have a, a closer exploration. So the study is underpinned by the self authorship uh, theory, which talks about uh, their stu the students' realities in their context uh, as young adults in higher education, and also uh, the, their, their journey and uh, their reality, and when they start to develop the sense of self uh, as they are making decisions and also confronted with challenges and uh, other negativity around them. Uh, Magolda uh, defined self-authorship um, as the capacity to internally define a coherent belief system, identify um, that, uh, an identified identity that coordinates mutual relationship with, with others. In this definition, uh, there are three dimensions as defined by Magolda. 
The first one is the, the cognitive dimension, which talks to the belief system. The, the second one is the intrapersonal dimension, which talks to the identity. And the third one is the interpersonal uh, dimension, which talks to relationship with others. So the intersection of the three dimension, dimension here, it then leads to the self-authorship. So I will actually share the findings uh, from the focus group, starting with the cognitive dimension. So what came up very clearly from the focus group uh, colleagues that we had with uh, the 10 participants is that uh, the students uh, are actually able to make their own judgments and they're able to make their own interpretation of what makes them succeed, such as being organized, such as being consistent in their studies and having a good working skills and keeping records of what they do. Just to read one verbatim quotation here. So one student mentioned that making sure that in terms of the organization and consistency, making sure that you are up to date with the work and sometimes it's not whether you can attend or have a lecture but make sure that you catch up and sometimes they are ahead on some of the modules. Then the second dimension, which is the interpersonal. So the participants indicated that they, they are actually not persuaded to take action based on what others think about them. And they're able to decide what is the best solution for them. Uh, for an example, uh, if I were to read one uh, verbatim extract here, so in terms of a strong sense of self. Uh, and I just tell them that I want to excel academically just for personal reasons. I just want to, I know that uh, in some way I have to, I'm not doing this for other people and I'm doing this for my own personal fulfillment. Coming to the last uh, dimension, which is the intrapersonal dimension. So the, the participants, they actually demonstrated the ability to maintain the strong sense of self. For example, uh, the strong um, self-belief and also the motivation. Uh, just one except here, the student said that I'm just someone ordinary from Beckville who believes that I can make it in life, even though maybe some circumstances, some circumstances once made me believe that I wouldn't be able to make it. So colleagues, what we are saying here, we, we are arguing uh, that we need to shift the way we look at uh, academic success and moving from the deficit model into the success discourse and try to flip the coin uh, from risk to strength. So one example that um, we are using in our project is what uh, Prof. Randir was talking about using the uh, Auto Scholar Advisor tool as learning support mechanism, which actually involves learning from and modeling high performance of academically high uh, performing student success as traits, and also supporting student self-authorship using collaborative learning support programs mainstream in the structured academic uh, program. As you saw that in the tool, so once uh, the student is able to see that they are not performing well, or they are just few marks away from being on track. So the tool will be able to actually um, guide or indicate or point out in terms of you, this is what you can do. This is the support that is available, both the academic support and non-academic support. So if they are, if they need support in terms of academic advising, if they need support in terms of the mentoring, so the tool will be able to assist the students in order to actually flag and also maybe the student can be able to, to point out where, where they, they can get support. And even if it's non-academic support, so we're hoping that the tool will be able to have this uh, integrated um, mechanism that can be used uh, as currently the support intervention that we have currently in, in our institution. We are working in silos and um, having this tool because it's kind of like holistic 
and it, it has the collaborative uh, mechanism. So we are just hoping that the student will be able to, uh, to be supported. And colleagues, uh, we, you are invited to join our team. And here's the inv invitation and I will send the link. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumala. Thank you, uh, Prof. Randir, for, for that very uh, interesting presentation. And thank you so much for, for keeping to time. I have a question in the chat from Nicola. Nicola, would you like to unmute yourself and share your question or would you like me to read it? Okay. Nicola's question is, what about the academically poor students? Are you identifying them and responding with various initiatives? That is the opposite of cum laude. It's interesting because the idea of early warning and tracking and analytics has so traditionally been associated with understanding and responding to poor academic performance. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, thank you very much. Um, a colleague says I've indicated uh, in, my, in the background that I think the focus has been more on uh, the student that are at risk or underperforming. So majority of institutions, including UKZN, we have a structured support uh, intervention program for the at-risk students and those students that are on, on probation. So we have the mentorship program for them, and uh, but we do note that uh, some of the interventions are reactive in nature. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Maybe. Thank you so much. Yes, Randir. Uh, yeah, if I can add to that, I, I think what we're saying in this project is um, why isn't everyone on cum laude? So what is the point where you depart from being cum laude? So in a way, it's trying to keep the aspiration higher and say um, we, we should be aiming to get everyone to cum laude. And if we had that kind of aspiration, then um, we'd have fewer uh, students who are aware uh, we are only worried about things like exclusion and so on. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Randir. We have a question from Ellen. Ellen, you have your hand. I see your hand. Yes, please. Um, I, I just want to uh, reflect on one of our keynotes from last year, who uh, um, was uh, um, talking about um, the performance of black undergraduate students, but, and his name is Sean Harper. He doesn't look at the deficit models. He looks at what, what uh, uh, attributes make the students successful. And once identified that, then says, well, if those are the attributes that we need, then you help the, the less fortunate with those attributes. So it's a positive model to find the um, underlying things that make people successful that you can uh, then uh, distribute to those students who are having some trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, indeed, for reminding us about the work of, of Sean Harper. Um, any comments from the team? Okay, uh, some comments in the chat. Nicola says she likes flipping the discourse approach. Reggie offers a thanks. Um, and then in the chat, Randir has posted the information for people to contact. Um, we have a question from Ore Arek Bauer. Would you like to share your question? I can read it. Or would you like to engage? Thank you. It's, I think it, I find this um, discussion very intriguing. It's so, it's so, it's so, it's just good to know that the people up there are still being targeted. And my question is that at what level do we start tracking them? Is it from first year or when they have progressed to the third and going to the final year? 
Thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to respond? Yes, please. Want anyone from the team to respond? Okay. Um, maybe let me, uh, I'll, I'll respond first. Um, in terms of starting uh, the, the tracking uh, for, for this project, because we're just starting the project, we started from the second year uh, since we have the, the results and we have the access uh, to the results for the 70% and above, which, above, which is uh, uh, the weighted average. But I hear the point uh, about uh, starting at a first year level. So I think as, the, as we progress with the project, so these are the things that we are going to uh, look into. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Randir has also posted into the chat his email address for anyone who'd like to contact him directly. Um, we have a hand from Inti Shabaku. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Sorry. Um, sorry, Delisha. Yes, in, in terms of the previous question, um, the way the tool is set up, um, it, it's working from, uh, from the first year uh, right now. So if um, a student is in their first year and they want to know currently, what am I on track for? Then uh, they can see uh, how on track they are for summa cum laude, for cum laude, for uh, first class, second class, and so on. So it's showing you at each stage what you are currently on track for, and it's showing you what um, you can do to, to get to the, the higher class of pass. So it, it's, a, like, it's a continuous approach. Um, there are some classifications which become inaccessible. So for example, summa cum laude, if you've dropped your credit weighted average in any semester prior to the current one, then it, it just disqualifies you from summa cum laude. But uh, for, for example, first class, second class, that works on just your overall average, then it's still possible to upgrade your class of pass. So it, it does work right from the first, first year, from the first semester onwards. Thank you for that clarity, Randir. Any other comments on that question before I take the hand of Inchi Shabangu? No? Okay. Anchi, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think my question is basically to find out if the team does any follow up qualitative studies to understand the leading factors of success, especially looking at maybe some of the variables that are considered risky for students like first generation status, the admission point scores and the school quantiles they came from like those that are considered to be at risk. Um, uh, theoretically or from literature basis what are the factors that are actually making them successful? If, if there is, uh, I assume there could be a large number that is also performing well. Thank you, would a team like, any member of the team like to answer that? I, I think it's, it's, it's a more having to do with um, academic resiliency and and having that someone who's really mentoring you in a who's showing interest in you i'm only reflecting on it from my own experience because i'm amongst the student who could not speak english for the better most coming from the university of limpopo and just like growing until vets university then going up it's a matter of really wanting it as much as the oxygen you you breathe every day it, it's, it's a matter of because my argument in this institution is always about give students uh, an understanding of the concept i don't i don't really um argue about under like i know that there is language deficiencies english language which is the language of instruction when they are being taught. And if they don't have basic understanding of the language itself, they will struggle to manipulate and play around with the concept. 
So I think what had transpired when I was at Rhodes was that one of the library uh, librarians sat down with me and said, okay, this is how you go about it. Take in the concept and say, if you understand this concept, you will understand the question that they're asking here. Then that was a thing. But I, I, I say it takes it just motivation and academic resiliency. Thanks, Reggie. Any other comments about uh, response to that question? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, 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 okay, Victor I, and then Ashni. Oh, okay, sorry, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the comment. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Kamalo and Prof. Radia for the presentation. Uh, just uh, to add uh, to the last question uh, regarding um, what has been done for the students that are moving on. Uh, just to say that uh, the way we are approaching the project is in two ways. First of all, uh, linking to what uh, Professor Dunpat uh, uh, said earlier uh, about in the last uh, presentation about using speculative uh, 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 models or approach to student support. Uh, we are trying to move away from that kind of uh, uh, approach to supporting students uh, that homogenizes uh, the students, especially those that we consider as at risk or, or performing poorly uh, with evidence from data uh, which we can now use to specifically uh, address the issues at the point where they are happening for an instance if the student is having a few uh, marks to get to a certain point then we know now that this is exactly what this student needs and this is the kind of mentoring uh, support that the student may uh, require uh, instead of uh, having to deal with everyone collectively, uh, like a, a one size fit all approach, uh, for an instance, to mentoring or academic advising support, or even uh, an aspect of the auto scholar also uh, uh, has a, an interface where the lecturers themselves uh, will be uh, having access to the information regarding the student progression. And so that that can also assist them in, in the uh, lecturer one on one consultation with students so that they know specifics of what to deal with these students. This will, uh, in very many ways, uh, reduce the time uh, that are spent in doing things that maybe are not uh, directly uh, going to have an impact on the particular student. It will also uh, reduce uh, the issue of resources having to to do so many things at, at a time, uh, which are just saying to one thing. So the, the student support will be streamlined for these students that are considered as at risk, uh, modeling them in, a, in, in line with the students that are highly performing by the time we already understand what are the tries, what are the things that are enabling them to perform uh, to be ahead of the other students in terms of uh, uh, their attributes, as, as one of the commentators have uh, mentioned. So we understand these attributes. How are they in this context? What are they and how are they enabling the students? So that is one aspect of it. Then the other aspect of it is the, the human dimension to it. You say that, uh, well, uh, if a student depending on uh, the circumstances surrounding that particular student is able to overcome these circumstances. It may not be similar circumstances, it may not be similar constraints, but another student, uh, as the last speaker has said, may now be able to understand that, yes, if I am able to follow these steps that other students have followed, learning the concept for an instance, it is something that I can break through and achieve uh, uh, cum laude or summa cum laude, or at least pass at 
my full potential. So this is how we are approaching this. We are not like uh, leaving uh, the students that are at risk on the sideline, but we want to flip the discourse instead of having to chase students to see what can be done to them to make them pass. We now want students to realize, understand that they have the potentiality to pass, and of course, which they do, and approach it from the strength where they have, and use other students to model the strength to those who seem not to have understood that they have the strength. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Ashni. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Prof. Randir and uh, Dr. Kamalo and Victor for that. Uh, and thank you, colleagues, for all your comments. Uh, I just want to comment regarding the qualitative um, question, or was it just a comment? So this qualitative aspect will give us an opportunity to gain rich uh, data on the actual experiences of these students. And uh, we're actually drawing from a theory of self-authorship, uh, where we're going to actually look at how do these students self-author their lives and take responsibility for their actions instead of um, maybe blaming others or blaming external factors, looking at their own self and um, being accountable for whatever they do. And uh, this theory of self-authorship actually looks at, um, it pinpoints, for example, um, how do students view knowledge and, and how do they demonstrate the ability to choose and stick to their own values and beliefs and goals? And it also covers an interpersonal dimension where they are able to negotiate their needs with the needs of others around them in terms of mentoring and receiving mentoring as well. So this qualitative aspect will obviously lend itself to to this theory and maybe you know we could actually uh, gain some insights as to how um these students are able to self-author as such thank you thank you so much ashni dorothy i see you keep unmuting yourself would you like to say something as a closing comment or question dorothy hendrix thank you colleagues and thank you for this uh for the learning here and the engagement um, just to say that, you know, um, we ran a program called part of a program called MapWorks that basically uh, drew on several levels of data. We engaged with just under 5,000 students over three um, kind of years and got data from that that reflected to them the practices, the studiousness practices the learning perceptions, et cetera. And uh, we were able then to automate a message back to them, indicating what their strengths are, what, they, what the concerns are, et cetera. What was phenomenal about this program, which we call Making Your Mark, uh, we, we checked about 24 uh, predictive analytical tools that were available uh, internationally, actually, and nationally. And um, we, we then, in our work, we would give the students what we called a map. We call this map works. The students got the map, the faculty got the map, the institution got the map, and we had a fourth map that we never declared or spoke about. The map was Prof. Witzkat and I would run the program. We looked at what does our team need, what are the skills that are coming up, week by week actually, and um, semester by semester. Now, what is significant is, you know, I, I was really touched by this cum laude tracking because of course, many of us believe actually and have experienced that every student has the God-given brilliance. But now here's the question, why do they arrive um, with deficits, for example? So we, I like the fact that we too, we don't speak about the deficit um, aspect of it, but the potential of it. However, that program now, we've migrated and we're at a very exciting point at UWC, where CSSS has been developing with technicians and 
with learning experts such as myself, where we've been developing our own tool, actually our predictive analytical tool with capacity for um, the critical mass of students. I come from CSSS, the Center for Student Support Services. Those who come for student support are not the critical mass, and yet we're sitting with experts in, in the department as well. So this work is proactive. Um, what is key though is we've stopped talking about support. Uh, if you look on the continuum, students that come into university might need, some might need more handholding and this thing called support. But the vision we have is about enabling. And anybody who's interested to learn more about that, certainly I'll put my email address in, in the chat as well. But just, you know, these dialogues really affirm to us that how key the Sia Pumalela and other dialogues are to learn from each other and even to let our own thinking evolve. There's much to learn from students and part of the ongoing data is where we listen. Students are not psychologists, I'm a psychologist as well. And they often diagnose where their problem is with the labels they know, anxiety, depression, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't necessarily, that might be symptoms, not causes of what they're going through and their academic demise. What I will honor though, is to admit that in our system, we have found that the alerts to the students we can catch and we can enable is often happening too late. People are referred to CSSS or come to us when the care marks um, can't be, um, you know, we can't do anything about it. But I just want to acknowledge the gift it is of these dialogues and the generous sharings from colleagues in these presentations as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you, everybody. We've gone over time, but I think the conversation was too, uh, there was just so much going on. I really couldn't stop it, but thank you. And all the best for the rest of the conference and all the best for your work as you continue in your projects. Thank you for the sharing and the questions and, and comments. Have a good afternoon. Dorothy has put her email address in the chat. Should anybody want to work with her and link with her to find out about their work in the CSSS at UWC. Thanks, Kalia. Have a great afternoon. See you at Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.